they talked them into getting a taking money out against the house in order to pay for medical bills. That was the worst thing that they could have done. Hello and welcome to the live stream. This is how to protect your home and savings from the nursing home. So we're going to be talking an awful lot about long-term care, paying for long-term care. What are the best ways to go about protecting assets, shielding them so they don't end up being lost to the nursing home? Uh, I've seen it way too many times where there's no planning ahead of someone actually going into a nursing home. And then the family's scrambling, trying to figure out, oh my gosh, how are we going to pay $10,000 a month? And suddenly, the person who needs care, they're spending everything down. And they may have a spouse outside the nursing home seeing all of that money go away. Medicaid is a program that is there specifically to make sure that doesn't happen. But what's happened over the years is they just make it so difficult darn difficult and confusing to keep what you're supposed to be allowed to keep. So we're going to start off talking, look, we're talking about a topic that nobody really wants to talk about. It's okay, what happens if I end up in a nursing home? Uh, people just don't want to address that. Now, the other thing is just the whole stigma of, quote, a nursing home ends up conjuring up these images of it's where you sit there and wait and that there isn't anything fulfilling that can happen. And that's just not the case. The other thing is people don't generally jump right to the nursing home with a lot of things unless there's some kind of catastrophic event. Now, just to talk a little bit about uh, nursing homes in general, uh, they're also there for rehabilitative care. What we focus on with Medicaid planning is that long-term care aspect, but often Medicare and Medicare supplements can be there if there is something that you end up being hospitalized and there's some physical therapy and rehab that's needed. Nursing homes are a lot less expensive than the hospitals, uh, but I know people, people in my own family who the second you mention nursing home, they just go, oh my gosh, forget it. No, no way. They're never going to do that. If you think it's important for educational videos like this to get out there, then please help us out by subscribing to the channel. Yes, as you know, if you actually know me, some of my volunteer past, I worked a lot with college students and one of the stories through the organization just kind of came to me. A 21 year old kid at college, was kind of running down a staircase, tripped, fell, and it was one of those steel staircases, banged into the into the floor, shattered his hip. And he ended up having to have a hip replacement at age 21. Well, where did he go? He didn't go from the hospital to home. He actually went to a nursing home. I think it was somewhere between four and six weeks. Oh, all the... the uh, seniors who were in that, they loved the fact that there was a 21 year old kid there and he just enjoyed meeting with all those people. But again, it's not that the nursing home is just there for just long-term care, but that long-term care ends up being the aspect that most of my clients are talking about and working with. So planning for this type of care often comes in stages. So People generally want to stay home as long as possible, or if not their home, possibly staying with a family member, having the family members give some care. Okay, if that works, great, but is it always going to be like that? Not necessarily. Suddenly things get a little bit worse, family gets busy with life, maybe it's, oh, some of the kids were helping grandma or grandpa out, and then one of them's going away to college, and there isn't as much help there. Okay, well, we can get someone to come in periodically to help with things, you know, a couple times a week. And then sometimes it's more. And then it goes from, well, okay, this just isn't working 
in the home, maybe there's a senior living center that has some assistance, but it's not full-blown nursing care, right? So that's that's another option. But uh, the eventually, there's a pretty high prob- probability, I think it's yeah, 50%, that you're going to spend some time in a nursing home. Whether that's short-term or long-term, those are the stats. So planning ahead just kind of makes sense. And again, planning in stages, this is something that you want to try to address as soon as you can, know the options. I do a lot of estate planning. Uh, My revocable living trust clients, we're typically meeting with them every year. Part of what I review with them every other year is long-term care, costs, how to handle it, how to pay for it. I run them through the different options, what's out there. And we kind of go from there. Uh, But the whole point is it's top of mind so that when something happens, they're going to come to me and we can plan ahead. I want to just throw out this as an example. Let's just say you want to take a trip. You're going on a vacation. You're going to Las Vegas. Do you book your plane tickets, go to the airport, get on the plane, arrive in Las Vegas and go, oh, I suppose I should have a hotel room. Let me go and book a hotel room now. Book a hotel room. Oh, I got to get over there. Okay, I guess I'm taking a taxi. Or if I'll rent a car, okay, I can rent a car. They have car rental places there. All right, you get there. Oh, this is great. I'm checked in. Everything's wonderful. I want to go. I want to go and lay out by the pool. Oh, well, I don't have a bathing suit. In fact, I didn't even pack a bag. Okay, I guess I'm going to have to go shopping for that. You don't do that. You look ahead at the different contingencies, you plan, you pack things, you have the hotel room set up. If you're going to rent a car, you're going to have, it's all kind of planned and laid out so that the vacation ends up being what you want it to be. So it's kind of the same thing with long-term care. You can't just reach a stage and go, okay, time to take a breather and not look a couple of steps ahead. And a lot of times the most effective thing is to plan as soon as there is something on the horizon to look outwards so that you don't lose everything to the nursing home. All right. So over the next, I'd say 30 to 45 minutes or so, just depends on how long I go on getting into some of these stories of things that have happened. Uh, We're going to go over this topic. We're going to cover it pretty darn well. But there are other resources that we have, and I'll tell you about those at the end. And uh, for the re- people who are watching this on the replay in the description, uh, you're going to see different links to other resources, which reminds me, look, this is YouTube. One of the best ways that we can get out good information for free to the public on topics like this is if you just like, and if you really want more information, subscribe to the channel. That helps us out so much. And it keeps putting the videos out there so that the people who are searching for this type of information are going to find it. So again, please, clicks, likes are free. Subscribe if you want to. It helps. It really, really does. So let's talk about one of the worst things that you can do is just to go down to the Medicaid office and say, hey, I have this potential issue. Unfortunately, that's kind of like going to the IRS office and asking them to help you fill out your taxes. They'll help you, but you're going to end up paying the maximum possible, and it's the same thing with going down to the Medicaid office. Um, Fortunately, about a, let's see, about a year and a half ago, uh, a gentleman and his son called me because his wife needed nursing home care, and um, I laid everything out. Okay, here's what we can do. Here's what we'll try to save and go ahead and engage us and we'll get going and uh, didn't hear from them. They decided to get the free plan through the Medicaid office by going down and talking to a caseworker. Um, and then finally they came back and called and said, hey, yeah, I need your help with an immediate annuity. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, yeah, we can do that, but... I need the whole context. I can't just go ahead and 
do an immediate annuity in terms of Medicaid planning, because I'm not going to see what the whole context is, that could be considered malpractice. Turns out that the caseworker at the Medicaid office had convinced the husband to spend just about everything down, go into debt for his wife's medical bills, didn't pay off the mortgage, and then it's, oh, well, the wife has too much in assets, she's got money in an IRA, turn that into an immediate annuity. All right, the immediate annuity is going to the wife. So that means it's all going to the nursing home. Not only did they not save what we were projecting, they ended up going into debt. And I finally, the only thing we could do at that point was liquidate it and help, and pay some of that medical debt off or pay the mortgage out, pay, pay the mortgage off. There was nothing you could do at that point. The Medicaid caseworker talked them into debt. So let's go ahead and start to cover what are you allowed to keep? Okay, so there really it's two different scenarios, individuals and couples. If it's an individual, all right, you're allowed to keep your primary residence and still qualify for Medicaid. Now there is a cap on that. I don't know what the, know what the numbers is, but it's it's a pretty high equity amount, especially for uh, for our particular state. Uh, I think it's somewhere in the six or seven hundred thousand dollar range. So okay, yeah, you get to keep the house, and you get to uh, qualify for Medicaid. You also can keep a vehicle. Okay, whether you can drive or not, it doesn't matter. If you you can have and own that vehicle, even if it means someone else needs to use your car to take you around to doctor's appointments and other things and get stuff for you. But here's the big one. You're only allowed to keep up to $2,000 in liquid assets. Now, there's also a couple of other things, like you can prepay for a funeral up to $10,000 and a couple of other odds and ends. But really, just talking about exempt assets, we focus on those three. Home, car, up to $2,000. Everything else that's liquid is considered countable. That means you got to spend it down if it's above that limit. All right. What if you have a spouse? Now, this varies from state to state. North Carolina just looked up the new number for 2023. Uh, the spouse gets to keep 148,620. Let's just round that down to 148,000. So 148,000 and, and 2,000, that's 150,000. This is an important point because it's not the same for all 50 states. There are some states that are called, quote, 50-50 states and others that aren't. If you're in a non-50-50 state, you have 150,000, you go, oh, spouse going into the facility, you get two. Spouse staying out of the facility, you get 148,000. No problem. Done. Don't have to spend any, any of that money down. All right. North Carolina is a 50-50 state. They go, oh, you have 150,000 exactly. Spouse outside the nursing home, you get to keep half. That's 75,000. Spouse going into the facility, oh, you've got 75,000 on your side. You're going to have to spend 73,000 of it down. Okay, there are some techniques to help get around that if it's done the right way and it's timed correctly. We're currently working on a case like that with some clients uh, to plan ahead for that. Uh, but th in the grand scheme of things, you might have accumulated a lot more money over time. And Medicaid is saying you just have to spend that down. Now, there is a third category of assets for Medicaid that most people don't understand or realize. And you probably don't see an awful lot of it um, when you, even when you're searching on YouTube and other channels. It's the non-countable assets. It's like, okay, it's there. We know it's there, but we're not going to count it. Well, what kind of things are those? If there is an estate that's in probate or 
out of probate, you're supposed to get a share, but it hasn't reached your account yet. It hasn't been distributed. It's still tied up. Well, Medicaid can't say, oh, well, you're going to get that money, so we're going to count it. They only count it when you actually get it. What are some other things? Uh, they don't count joint real estate if you own it jointly with a non-spouse. So just to give you the scenario, you own, you and a spouse own half of a vacation condo and a friend of yours and their spouse, they own the other half. Medicaid isn't going to look at that and count that for eligibility because it's with another joint owner. The, the thought process is to go through is like, well, if they make you sell that, you could be depriving the other couple of their property rights. And so they just don't look at it. So you can have those types of assets and it's exempt. No problem. Okay, you can qualify for Medicaid. But then what about Medicaid recovery? This is, again, looking more steps ahead. I've seen this far too many times where, oh, yeah, we, they, they allowed you to keep the house, so no problem, no issue. You qualify for Medicaid. Someone ends up in a facility. They're there for five, six, seven, ten years. Medicaid pays for all of it. Oh, well, at least now we, you know, we're going to get to keep the house after mom or grandma or grandpa, after dad passes on, we're still going to keep the house. Nope. Medicaid is going to put a lien against that house. So they are going to get paid back for every penny out of that house. And if they've been there for a considerable amount of time, it could exceed the value of the house. Oh my God, well, how do you get around that? Well, we're going to talk about a couple of techniques, but there's actually, there's a lot more. Again, you'll see it in the resources section. I might as well mention it now. We've got a free webinar that's already up, payforlongtermcare.com, that talks about a couple of these techniques. But we also have the medicaidcrashcourse.com. That, that one's not free. That's a full-on background education on Medicaid planning, and it goes through all of the different potential uh, rules for Medicaid, understanding them, examples, and all that other stuff, uh, a little more advanced. But we're going to talk about a couple of different techniques and things that we can do to help you keep the house. So uh, let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about income. Because income is another topic that ends up uh, confusing people because it's the difference between income and assets and whether or not they qualify. Okay. If you're going into a facility, more or less income doesn't really matter. You're still going to qualify as long as your income wouldn't pay for the care without Medicaid's help. But you should always plan and count on 100% of the income for the person going into the facility, having that income go to pay for their care first. The way to really look at Medicaid for long-term care is to think about it as if it were a long-term care insurance policy, but you have co-pays and deductibles. All right, well, what's your deductible? It's everything except your exempt assets. Oh, so you got to spend everything down before it kicks in. Right. Well, what's what's the copay? It's all of your income each month. They do allow you to keep a personal needs allowance, but your checking account can't go above that $2,000 mark. So you should again count on all the income going there. Well, what about if it's if they're married and the spouse is outside the nursing home, what happens with their income? Remember when we talked about the, the spouse who's staying in the community, called the community spouse, they get to keep a certain level of assets, but their assets jointly with the spouse all still count. It's not the same thing with income. The spouse who's outside the facility, 
they're going to get to keep their income so that they are going to be self-sufficient. This is one of the things a lot of people don't really necessarily understand um, about government, about laws, about why they do a lot of the things that they do and why the regulations are the way they are. They don't want to impoverish a spouse who's not going into the facility because then they're just going to go on welfare and take up resources from the state on the other end of things. So, yeah, they want the asset to go below a certain level, to, you know, up to a certain level and no higher, but they don't want to take away that spouse's income because then the state's going to have to kick in. All right. Sometimes the state's going to have to kick in no matter what. And there are ways to get some of the income diverted from the spouse who's in the facility if the spouse outside doesn't have the resources or the income to live on their own. So those are just detailed rules. But just in general, spouse going into the facility, all the income goes to the facility. Spouse outside, no issue with that. This is why there are things, though, like immediate annuities that can sometimes help out. Because if a couple has too much in liquid assets, if they can convert some of the assets so the income stream is going to the spouse outside the facility, then it's no longer an asset but it's income that that spouse can use. So it's very important to know the, the distinction between income and assets and for the person going into the facility versus their spouse. So that's one te technique. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the home because after all, this is how to protect your home and savings from the nursing home. Um, I told you that there were a couple of techniques. Well, okay, we're still using the couple. As an example, let's just say in all of these, we're going to say they've got $500,000 in liquid assets, a home that the equity limit is within the range, and they have a vehicle. So really, the, the worry there is that $500,000. Well, it's the house, the vehicle, and the money is counted separately, but the house and the vehicle is between the spouses, what do you end up doing then? Do you keep the house titled in both spouses' names, joint with the right of survivorship? Well, why would you? If you move the house 100% into the name of the spouse who's staying outside the nursing home, Medicaid can't recover against that. And that's an allowable transfer. So sometimes when we're looking and we're planning with clients, we're not just looking at, okay, this is the client that needs to qualify for Medicaid and that's it. That's all our job. We're not going to look at anything else. No, no, no. We're going to keep looking down the road. We may set up irrevocable trusts, another technique we'll talk about in a few minutes, and have after the spouse in the nursing home qualifies for Medicaid, the spouse outside can put the house into an irrevocable trust and start the five-year clock if they end up needing nursing home care. So that's one way to protect the house. Another one which is really good for North Carolina, but it's not in all states, so this isn't necessarily going to end up working. You can have... Maybe if it's three kids, they each buy 1% of the house with mom and dad. So there's an actual contract and a payment. And now the five of them are on the deed as joint with a right of survivorship. Well, because there's five people on the deed and, well, they're not all spouses, it's a non-countable asset. And the way North Carolina works, if you end up uh, with mom and dad passing on, the three kids inherit the house. It's done so outside of probate. Medicaid can only recover what's inside of probate. So this is a perfectly legal way to handle setting things up to transfer and stay out of the clutches 
of Medicaid and you don't have to spend it down for and pay that money to get into the nursing home, you can end up saving the house. So that's again, that's a second technique. What is then what does I hear about irrevocable trust, the five year look back period? What what's this thing with irrevocable trust? Well, all right, we've we've got other videos on that where we talk about the Medicaid toolbox and all the different types of trust that are in there. But let's keep it simple. The basic, quote, two trust solution. We have an irrevocable property trust and an irrevocable family trust. You move the real estate into the irrevocable property trust. You move whatever money you're trying to protect into the irrevocable family trust. Five years later, it's completely dropped off of Medicaid's radar because Medicaid looks at the gifts that were done and that transfer would be qualified as a gift. Okay. So five years later, it's done. It's completely off Medicaid's radar. Now, I often talk about this when I'm meeting with my estate planning clients for an annual review meeting and they're like, that's great, that's wonderful, let's go ahead and do that. Whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. There's a catch here. You can't be the trustee of your own trust. And in fact, technically, you're not even really the beneficiary of the one with the money. So you're relying on the trustee to be able to provide for you and it's out of the goodness of their heart. It really has to be that you're pushing those assets away and saying they're not mine anymore. Oh, I don't want to do that. Most people don't. Not until there is a specific issue that's going to come up and they see, okay, something's coming down the road. But that's not the end all be all of planning because there are other ways to secure assets. Uh, so let's use that. Let's use these examples, the $500,000, the home, the vehicle, and we'll use a couple of different scenarios. First one, and this is the most common, they don't do anything. They pinch pennies as much as they can, hold all the money back that they can. They definitely aren't going to hire somebody to help them out because professional fees are, well, that's pretty high. We're already having to pay $10,000 a month to the nursing home. Why should we pay, you know, a bunch of money to someone uh, to tell us how to save the other hundreds of thousands of dollars? This is, again, people just end up getting stunned by how complicated the rules are. They throw up their hand and say, forget it. We're just going to spend everything. And unfortunately, that's kind of the way they make the rules they want people to go ahead and do things that way. All right. So they spend the money down and then it's, oh, well, I've seen this. Oh, we'll do a reverse mortgage and we'll take money out. And now the house is leveraged. You can't do anything. You can't even do those 1% sales anymore. Um, and then, well, okay, my, the spouse outside the facility, maybe they passed on or they moved in with kids sell the house, spend all of that money down, and then everything's lost to the nursing home. That is the most common way of things happening. Second, we or kind of talked about, oh, well, we want to plan ahead. Maybe they're getting long-term care insurance policies. There are other types of what we call hybrid life insurance and annuities and things like that that can help pay for long-term care. But the thing is, they're looking way ahead and they're kind of looking five years ahead. And maybe they do move those assets into those irrevocable trusts. All right. Well, that can work well. And again, why would you do it? If you've got an individual or you've got a couple, uh, one of them is in those very early stages of dementia. And it's like, we might have five years. We might have four Right now, it's very early. Let's go ahead and try to see if we can beat that five-year clock. Well, what if they get only four years? Well, then maybe it's one of the kids there, the trustee. They can take the money out and pay to get them past the five-year mark. That's the planning ahead. But then there's also the emergency care. The emergency Medicaid planning. What can you do quickly? Well, all right, I'm going to highlight this uh, just because it worked so well to meet that asset test. And it's, it's going to sound a little complicated, but like I said, that's because that's how Medicaid makes the rules. 
Well, we had a, it was my client's, it was her mother needed care. It was dementia, but she was still kind of self-sufficient in terms of, well, she could dress herself, feed herself, handle all the different activities of daily living, except she couldn't just be left on her own because she would wander off. There would have been instances of, okay, trying to cook and forgetting something and starting a fire. So just needed to be watched 24-7 and was in a facility. And at that point, income was kind of covering everything. Uh, and um, these are rough numbers. She had about $340,000 and that was, well, they sold the house. And the only other big asset was a life insurance policy with a $60,000 cash value, but about a $400,000 death benefit. Okay, how does Medicaid look at that? It's the 340 plus the 60,000, that's 400,000. If they just went to Medicaid and got the plan from Medicaid, they go, oh, well, as soon as you spend $398,000 on her care, then we can have you apply for Medicaid because then she'll be under the 2000 Okay, that would have been losing everything. What's the alternative? We had the daughter who was also mom's power of attorney set up those two irrevocable trusts and a few more. So the protective trusts were there, but mom couldn't move the money in. Well, okay, take a look at the exempt assets. What could mom have? Mom could have a primary residence. Was she just going to go out and buy a house? Well, wait a minute. Daughter and son-in-law, they have a house and, again, rounding the numbers, $500,000 house paid off. Okay. Well, mom's countable assets are $400,000. Mom can buy 80% of the house. And now the three of them can end up owning that house as joint with a right of survivorship. Problem is, they didn't want to necessarily give up the life insurance either, because look, there were four kids, that's four hundred thousand. That's a significant amount of a death benefit to just get away and you know, give it away and just drain the policy. So what did they do? Son in law happened to have sixty thousand dollars free and bought the policy for the cash value. So that was a transaction, again, all documented. So now mom actually had 400,000 cash, set up the contract, set up the deed, mom purchased the 80% of the primary residence, the three of them are on the deed, joint with the right of survivorship. So, well, where did that $400,000 go? It went to daughter and son-in-law. What did they do with it? Well, they looked at it and said, well, really, we sold 80% of our house. It's technically our money. Sorry about that audio glitch there. It's our money. Uh, what are we going to do? Well, morally, it's mom's. Let's put it in the irrevocable family trust. So they moved the $400,000 into the protective trust, not mom. No five-year look back period. What's the first transaction? Daughter, who is the trustee, buys the life insurance policy from son-in-law, her husband, for exactly what the cash value is, moves it into the trust. Within a couple of months, everything was filtered through this house sale so that they were able to keep all of it. So yeah, mom still had some ongoing expenses, but she, the way this particular case worked out, she had some really good uh, pensions lining up. I think it was only about $6,000 a year or so was being drained out of her assets to pay for what her pension didn't. And they were able to get enough growth to more than cover that inside the trust. So at that point though, from an asset point of view, Mom's qualified. So there are ways to do emergency care. I'm sorry, emergency Medicaid planning. All right, so what are some of the do's and don'ts 
in some of these techniques because believe me i've heard everything and it's uh well my my neighbor's ex-girlfriend's cousin's barista had a father who needed care and they just did x y and z and it all worked out and the big one is oh well yeah go ahead and give the house to the kids that's what my cousin did um, and it worked out fine. Well, they don't mention that they did that transaction like 10 years before care was ever needed. And their purpose was, oh, God, you know, mom or dad's going to need care within the next few months. What do we do? That's just going to end up being a gift for Medicaid purposes, and it's going to blow everything up. So don't just gift. That's a big thing. It, you can gift if it's a coordinated plan which involves some of this gifting. But far better are ways to, quote, filter things out and have transactions that are legitimate to either spend money or convert assets so you can keep as much as possible within the family. If you've heard, oh, well, you can give 17000 or 15000 it was 15000 for a long time. You can give $15,000 a year to all the kids and grandkids. It's no problem. Yes, it is a problem. What that rule was was about filling out a gift tax form. It has zero to do with whether you qualify for Medicaid. Believe me, Medicaid cares very much about those gifts, and it could end up with ineligibility periods. So you don't want to do that if you can avoid it. Again, unless it's all laid out as part of a coordinated plan. Uh, what does Medicaid want you to do with all those assets? Oh, spend it all on care. Now, the house ends up being the biggest asset, uh, but one of the biggest impediments to some of these transfers is if there's a mortgage on it. And believe me, I've heard this. Oh, but I've got a great interest rate on the mortgage. I, you know, I don't want to give up the mortgage because I can make more money uh, in the market. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. We are not talking about regular retirement anymore. We're talking about planning for long-term care. I don't care how much, oh, the market's going to do this. It's, it could, I could get make so much more money here than if I paid off the mortgage. But you've got... $10,000 a month in an expense that's going to drain away from that. So unfortunately, there are uh, some financial advisors who don't understand the Medicaid planning piece of it at all, or they intentionally just ignore that. And it's, oh, no, 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 I can do I can do better for you here doing this. Don't take the money out. There's a lot that needs to be done to get you in the right position. And some of it's going to, you know, if you're paying off debts, those debts are still going to be there. Like I mentioned with that very first father, son, and mom who needed the care, they talked them into getting a, taking money out against the house in order to pay for medical bills. That was the worst thing that they could have done. Paying off debts uh, ends up being one of the biggest things and best things that you can do because it not only because it frees up other types of transfers or exchanges that can protect the money, those debts are going to be around even if you're qualified for Medicaid, so you might as well get rid of them. Oh, should we prepay for funerals? Well, wait a minute. Part of what we set up with, like we call it the Medicaid planning toolbox, we do have a trust. There is a funeral trust that's meant and intended to pay for those final expenses. Burial, cremation, services, that type of stuff. You can put up to $10,000 in there, but we don't typically do that right up front. Usually if my clients aren't going into the nursing home next week, it's we're planning ahead, we're moving stuff, we're making some changes and moving stuff around. The clients may move the bulk of what they want into these trusts, but they're going to keep ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 in their account to keep paying for things on their own. And if the money goes down, then maybe whoever the trustee is can give them a little bit more through 
a filtering process so that they are they can get some money back but when it comes down to it and this could be several years later we got to get you below that two thousand dollar mark that's when money can go in there you don't just put ten thousand dollars in there because oh well that's you know it's great that's going to pay for the funeral and maybe there's some money left over there's never money left over because whatever's left over has to go to pay back medicaid so it's it doesn't make sense to do that but if you have prepaid for funerals that's okay that's allowed it, it, burial plots sometimes not just for you and a spouse depending on the state i believe it was grandkids nieces and nephews and siblings you can buy everything for buy funeral plots burial plots for the entire extended family uh yeah just short of the cousin level but you got to check your different state laws for that so there's lots of things that money could be spent on uh, the whole biggest thing is ju don't just go off and start doing something here or something there that's like yeah we're gonna go to las vegas we're gonna get, get on the plane and you don't have the plan for the hotel and for everything else after that and you haven't packed a bag it's let's plan the whole thing out now does that mean that the plan you put in place at the very start is definitely always a hundred percent going to be exactly the same no because stuff happens maybe you needed care more quickly than you thought okay you've got to pivot and move a couple of things and adjust the plan but you are f much further ahead in saving money from the nursing home if you do have a coordinated reason plan that allows for some flexibility if circumstances change all right so yeah what are some other myths that are out there oh if you don't have five years you can't do planning well yeah you can is it the same for everyone absolutely not that kind of peak example i gave you with mom having three hundred and forty thousand and that one life insurance policy uh that was the perfect storm of doing everything the way we did it if there were some other complications we might be able to use that technique but not everybody can use that technique what if mom already had the house well obviously putting money into one of their kids house isn't something that's going to work unless they give up their own house they can only have the one personal uh one primary residence they can't have more without it can't be becoming a countable asset so all right so um what other myths are out there let's go ahead uh we've got okay so let's go ahead and check and see if there are questions uh we got dave hey dave saying hello from san jose california hope everything's going well with you dave uh, we got anybody else who wants to throw in a question please go ahead uh, so yeah we've got a couple of active cases that we're working on right now that are quite interesting um uh, one of them again because of their asset makeup there really wasn't even anything that we had to do with irrevocable trusts right now we were able to just generally do estate planning a specific way using a revocable living trust and moving the house in because that it's too complicated to do without graphs and these are one of the techniques uh, that i put in the medicaid crash course where i have the boxes and everything in the arrows showing how everything works uh, so we're able to actually maximize what the spouse who isn't going into the facility what they're going to keep uh, using this technique but then also look everybody just needs the power of attorney the health care power of attorney living will all those other ancillary documents that's just a good thing to have anyway just for estate planning and because we don't know what's going to happen in life so uh, that's a case we're working on now we don't even have to use the medicaid trusts we're planning well enough ahead that we're maximizing it just using an estate planning using a revocable living trust 
All right. Any other questions out there? Okay, not bad. So that was, it's just about 45 minutes of actual time. Plus we started the stream 10 minutes early with some music giving the countdown clock. So uh, everybody, uh, just the resources that I mentioned and we're going to put in the description uh, for the replay. Uh, payforlongtermcare.com is that webinar, the free webinar that's out there. Uh, there's also medicaidcrashcourse.com. That's where we've got the paid course that really kind of goes in depth into the different rules for Medicaid and some of the potential strategies uh, in a lot more detail than we can do in the free webinars. So there's several hours worth of really good stuff in that. Um, and you can always check out my law firm's website at livingtrustlawfirm.com. Uh, we put up some different things there, articles and blogs. And uh, definitely, again, just a plug for the channel. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you can, because it really helps get this information out there. So as I always tell my clients, look, please stay safe, plan ahead, and enjoy life. And whatever you do, make it a great day. Thank you.